Well, it's a great honor to be here tonight. Um, I personally like science a lot and I like cocktails a lot, so I cannot think of a better place to be. Um, I also enjoyed this embarrassing introduction. <laughs> and, and tonight I will try to explain you a little bit uh, what the holographic principle is. So the holographic principle is the last one in this list of famous principles. There are many principles in the world. I, for example, have only one principle, which is that I don't have any principles, and I'm not even quite sure about that principle either. <laughs> and here are some principles. Um, some of you might know some of these. So, for example, the principle of sufficient reason is the statement that things only happen because they had a reason to happen. Not to be confused with whether something happens for a purpose. Many things happen for no purpose whatsoever, but there was a reason why they happened. That's the first principle. The falsification principle, an important principle in science, a good theory should be falsifiable. There's the difference principle, that's a weird one, that is the statement that it's okay to make the gap between the rich and the poor larger, as long as the poor get better along the way. It's an interesting economic principle. Then there's Occam's razor, which is a great scientific principle, which states that if you have many explanations of the same thing, the simplest explanation and the most beautiful explanation is always the right one. Um, and then there are some other more physical principles that I will touch upon in the remaining. And the last thing I want to explain today is the holographic principle. This is the most important principle of all because it's a principle that tells us something deep and profound about the nature of space and time. It tells us something about the degrees of freedom that constitute all of us and the universe. And I will try to explain to you what that is. Now the question, um, this holographic principle came about uh, because um, of us physicists thinking for many years about the nature of space and time. We were certainly not the first ones to think about space and time. In fact, mankind has thought about space and time for a long period. For example, already in the 4th century, um, Saint Augustine got very confused about what time is and he came up with the brilliant idea that time is just an illusion. Then Newton came up with the idea that time and space are absolute. They are fixed once and for all, just like in a three-dimensional frame. Um, and that's what they are, they're there forever, they're just given to us. And then Leibniz around the same time said that space and time are not absolute, they are only defined uh, with respect to something else. There is no such a thing as an absolute space and time. Uh, and there have many other interesting philosophical uh, things that have been written about the nature of space and time, but obviously they were all wrong, because they did not know about the holographic principle. Now, although we did have a very deep understanding of what space and time really are, it did not prevent mankind from coming up with very precise definitions of what these things are. For example, here is the definition of one second. And the definition of a second has changed over time. Right now, the definition of a second is something rather useless, you would think, because it's the duration of 9,192,600,000 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of a cesium-133 atom. So if you really want to measure time accurately, this is how you do it. And it sounds like we have a perfect understanding of a second. And similarly, it sounds like we have a perfect understanding of what a meter is, what space is. And interestingly, the uh, most recent definition of what a meter is, um, is much simpler than the other ones. It just tells you that it's the length of the path traveled by light in vacuum during a certain time interval. But by this definition, the speed of light is now exactly fixed. It's not something you can measure anymore. It's just determined by the definition of a meter. It's very useful. <laughs> so this point of view um, of Newton, that space and time are absolute, uh, basically persisted more or less until the beginning of the 20th century, when Einstein came along, and Einstein invented the special theory of relativity. And underlying the special theory of relativity is, is a principle, it's called the equivalence principle. That's a very important uh, principle. And it states that the laws of physics are the same, are identical for all observers that are not subject to an external force. If you're subject to an external force, you're being accelerated, you're using, you hit a gas in the car or something like that, and you feel the force in your back, then this does not apply. 
But if you're floating in the spaceship of the universe and the engine is off, no force is acting on you, you're just drifting away, then the statement is that the laws of nature are exactly the same. And that sounds like a pretty easy statement to make, but it's a very strange statement to make. Because one of the implications of the equivalence principle is that the speed of light is going to be the same for all observers. And that is completely counterintuitive. You would normally have thought that if you have a light ray and you run along the light ray, that with respect to you, light will go slightly slower, right? Just like a car. And if you go against the light ray, you go slightly faster. But this equivalence principle tells us that this is not what will happen, because the speed of light is fixed by laws of physics. It tells us the speed of light will be exactly the same. And that's a crazy idea, but you can test it experimentally, and it is in fact true, it has been tested experimentally. It's very weird, it's hard to, to conceive, because it goes against our intuition. Our intuition, our human brain, was not designed to understand it. So, you get used to this, and it's an interesting question whether you actually ever really understand it or whether you just get used to it if you use it all the time. It doesn't really fit in our brain. Um, but in some sense this principle goes back already to, uh, to Galileo Galilei, who is this uh, friendly chap in the right top corner here. Um, because it's a familiar phenomenon to some extent. For example, imagine that you're in a boat playing a game of tennis, like many of us have done. You're in a boat, it's moving with some constant velocity. There's no window, you're just sitting in the boat. And you can just play tennis in the boat, but you would never be able to figure out whether the boat is moving or not, because it's not going to have any influence on the behavior of the tennis ball. Um, so already here, um, the behavior of the tennis game does not depend on the speed of the boat. And in some sense, this is a precursor of this equivalence principle. Um, but the equivalence principle is much more precise. There were times when people thought that light needs to propagate through something. It needs something to move. Some substance. It was called an ether. Um, some weird substance. And then, if that would really exist, then our Earth would be moving through this substance somehow. It would be moving through this big soup of invisible uh, glug. So, if that were the case, then you would see changes in the speed of light, because the speed of light would be only the speed of light with respect to this weird stuff. But we've done measurements, uh, and the speed of light is always the same, and in particular all this annoying stuff is not there. This is an example of this Occam's razor principle. A, this, is, this is ugly. This is some weird unknown substance, it's ugly, uh, we don't need it, so we get rid of it. Um, the consequences of this uh, principle of special relativity are kind of strange. For example, it predicts, and this is again something one can check experimentally, that when a ball moves, it will change its shape. And that's purely due to this weird equivalence principle. It implies that the ball will be deformed in this way. It's very strange. This is again very counterintuitive, but it follows from special relativity. Another great feature of special relativity is the so-called twin paradox. You can do a computation, um, and suppose you have twins that have the same age, and one of the two enters a spaceship, flies with almost the speed of flight to a distant star, turns around and flies back with almost the speed of flight to planet Earth, then the astronaut will barely have aged. Because time is no longer something absolute, it's called the theory of relativity for a reason, everything becomes relative. Uh, so by the time the astronaut gets back, he is slightly older, but the twin brother is much older. Uh, and this is called a paradox. There's no actual paradox here. It's, it's perfectly consistent, it's just very strange. So in some sense, because of special relativity, we can now travel into the future. All we need to do is travel very fast. If you travel fast enough, you can travel into the future. You cannot travel back, but you can go into the future. Um, and one of the nice things of, of special relativity is that it makes everything geometric. It combines everything in a beautiful geometric way. And time and space are kind of put on the same footing. We always feel like time and space are completely different things, uh, but according to special relativity, time and space are not two separate entities, they're part of something larger, which we usually call space-time. 
And to illustrate a little bit why we can think of time as a direction, here's a flip book. This is just a large stack of pieces of paper. And what you can see here is that um, here's the clip. Does anyone recognize the clip? <laughs> Open Gangnam style, yeah, that's right. So you can make the clip just by your stack of paper, and if you're very patient and you make all these pictures, you see it actually exactly follows the entire clip. It's a lot of work, but it can be done. <laughs> so what this illustrates is that this the direction along the pile of paper plays the role of time. Because as you go through the pile of paper, you move through time. And this is the sense in which we view time as an extra dimension. It's just a cartoon, but it gives the feeling. So if our world was two-dimensional, and we wanted to uh, think of this, time, this picture moving in time, we could model it with this three-dimensional stack of paper. And in the same way, we can model a three-dimensional movie with a four-dimensional stack of paper. We just need an extra dimension corresponding to time. So this was a, an important step, but this equivalence principle turned out to actually be even more important because in 1915 Einstein invented general relativity which combined this special relativity thing with, with gravity uh, and the equivalence principle is still there, but it's formulated in a slightly more general way. It now states that the laws of nature are the same for all freely falling observers, but that's kind of the same as not having a force acting on you. You might think that when you fall, there's a force acting on you, it's pulling you down, right? That's precisely not what's going on. If you, if you fall and you do nothing, then no force is acting on you. It's when you sit here that the force is acting on you. It's the chair that is exerting force on your behind. <laughs> that will increase in time. So, <laughs> that's what's going on there. And then, and, if you, and this is a very beautiful mathematical theory that Einstein developed, and it predicts many nice things. And in particular, it explains that gravity isn't really a force, it is just a consequence, it follows from geometry. So what happens is that if you put a planet somewhere, what it does, it, it distorts the geometry of space and time. Just like you can deform a sheet of rubber, you can also take our four-dimensional space-time and change its shape. You always think that if you have a sheet of rubber and you change its shape, it needs to go in another direction. Uh, but that's not, mathematically that's not necessary, you can just deform its shape anyway, you don't need this extra direction. So, we can deform our space-time just for free. And what happens is that it gets deformed precisely in such a way that it looks like things get attracted to a planet, but it is just the natural force-free motion in this weird geometry that is created by this mass. So that's a nice consequence of general relativity. And general relativity has this famous extreme prediction. It tells us that when you have enough mass, it will collapse. And it will form something, a singularity, something very strange that we don't fully understand. Uh, and it will form something called a black hole. And the black hole is this wonderful beast that has a so-called horizon, and once you cross the horizon, you can never turn back. It's like a one-way street. It's also a one-way street for light. So light can go in, but light never comes out, and this is why it's called a black hole. Literally, it's literally black, and it's literally a hole. <laughs> and if you do the mathematics, if you take this theory of Einstein, and you look at general relativity, and you do some computations, you will find that the prediction of the equations, we have not actually done the experiment, the prediction of the equations is that as you go into this dark hole, you will eventually run into a place where space and time cease to exist, something we call a singularity. And Einstein's theory does not tell us what that singularity is, or what will happen if we reach the singularity. We have discovered black holes in nature. We could, in principle, do the experiment. All we need to do is jump into the black hole and see what happens. <laughs> It's a useless experiment because we cannot tell the people that stay behind what happened. <laughs> but you will have the great satisfaction of knowing what happened. 
But it's always unpleasant if you have a singularity and, and you have a nice theory, but it's incomplete. It doesn't tell you everything. And it does not tell you what happens at the singularity. That's a sign that your theory is not entirely complete. Now, there's more in nature than just gravity. There's also something called quantum mechanics. And I could easily talk for one hour about quantum mechanics, because if special relativity were counterintuitive and difficult to understand, then don't get me started about quantum mechanics. <laughs> quantum mechanics, that I won't need like any actual quantum mechanics, but the main idea of quantum mechanics is, is that particles and waves are kind of the same thing. And it just depends on your perspective whether something looks a bit like a particle or whether it looks, something looks like a wave. There's a very rough analogy you can make with sound. Like if you produce a constant tone, I cannot sing, but it will be something like mm, and that's a wave. But you can superpose waves and make it sound more like a particle, something like a right? And um, this, this is a bit the way in which the waves of quantum mechanics can combine themselves Sometimes in something that looks more like a wave, and sometimes that looks more like a particle. But they're all manifestations of the same thing. And for example, if we had a gun that shot electrons, small particles, and we would shoot that gun at two open slits, then we know that if you would do that with waves, so just imagine some water waves that go through two small openings, they will then disperse and they will start to interfere. The prediction of quantum mechanics is that the same will happen with particles. Particles can destructively interfere, just like sound, Bose headsets and so on, you can destructively interfere, you can make anti-noise and it just cancels out. The same can happen with particles. That's a bizarre statement because how can a particle annihilate if another particle doesn't make any sense, but in quantum mechanics it can happen. And for example, the um, picture of a hydrogen atom that we normally have, that's this classical picture. There's a little nucleus here, and then there's this electron that just has a nice circular orbit. That's how we usually think of an atom. This is very wrong. An actual atom is more something like this. It's a fuzzy cloud where the density of the light tells us something about the probability that the electron is somewhere. The electron is kind of everywhere at the same time, but it has different probabilities of being somewhere. It's, it's a foggy cloud of something. And if you would then try to measure where the electron is, you would find that this is precisely the probability that you will find it somewhere. So an actual hydrogen atom is, is a very foggy, weird thing. It's, this is not a good picture of a hydrogen atom. And quantum mechanics is a wonderful theory. Without quantum mechanics, this, this bottle here would not stay on the table, it would fall straight through. Because this table is mostly empty. In an atom, it's mostly empty space. And the reason why it all sort of holds together is because of quantum mechanics. Classically, you could not even make a stable hydrogen atom. It would just sort of spiral, this electron would just spiral in and collapse onto this, this center. And then there are all kinds of nice statements. And this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, yet another principle. And it tells us that in quantum mechanics there's a new parameter. It's called the Planck's constant, and it's usually denoted by H, or by H with a little thing through it. We call it H bar. Um, and this inequality tells us something fundamental about quantum mechanics, because it tells us that we can never simultaneously measure energy and time with arbitrary accuracy. There's a fundamental limitation to our knowledge of what energy and time is. And similarly, there's a fundamental uncertainty about our knowledge of what velocity and position is. In particular, in quantum mechanics, if you, if you have a well, and you have a little ball, and you want to put it precisely at the center, it's forbidden to be precisely in the middle of the well and, be, and not move. Because if it would be in the middle of the well and not move, we would know exactly what the position is, maybe precisely at the minimum of the well, and we also would also know exactly what its velocity is, namely zero. But knowing those two things with that accuracy at the same time is forbidden by quantum mechanics. And what happens is that the ball will start to vibrate a little bit, and there will be a very little bit of energy there, which we call the ground state energy. And classically this is ridiculous, but it's a consequence of quantum mechanics. And this little wiggle 
we can measure. We have measured it and it's really there. And quantum mechanics does a great job of explaining many things. For example, uh, we can apply quantum mechanics to, to a gas of molecules and we can compute the pressure as a function of the density and the temperature in quantum mechanics. Uh, and if you do that for a gas in the box using quantum mechanics, you find something rather intuitive. You will find that the free energy, the amount of energy that sits in this box is proportional to the volume. That's pretty easy, right? Because if you make a box twice, as si twice the same uh, size and you keep the temperature the same, you have twice as many particles, they move at the same speed, so there's twice as much energy. So the amount of energy in a box is proportional to the volume of the box. It's kind of intuitive. And similarly, there is a somewhat tricky quantity, which is not so easy to define properly, which we call entropy, but it's an important notion. It, it tells us something about the, um, our ignorance of the system, but you can more or less think of it um, as something like energy for the sake of this presentation. And also the entropy here scales like the volume, the argument is roughly the same. It's very important. So that if you just do a gas, the amount of energy and the amount of entropy, whatever the precise is, scales as the volume. Um, now, unfortunately, quantum gravity does not apply directly to gravity. Uh, it's very difficult to reconcile quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and a rough reason for why it's difficult to put these nice, beautiful theories, Einstein's theory of general relativity and quantum mechanics together, is that quantum mechanics is, is ultimately still based, although I said particles and waves are the same thing, it's ultimately based on the idea that things, the fundamental things of it are point particles. But a point particle, the, in general relativity, means that you put a little bit of mass in, in, an, in a point, in something infinitesimally small. And then in general relativity, this will always be a black hole, it will never be a point particle. And, and this creates all kinds of problems when you start to combine these theories and makes it all into a big mess. Um, but the tension, the, 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 the problem of, re, of uniting quantum mechanics and gravity becomes particularly clear when one considers a black hole. As so I will now try to explain. <laughs> but before explaining that, let me just mention that uh, we're in a very colorful field. And some of the great people here, they, uh, are, you can find them on this slide. This is a famous quiz where you have to separate the scientists from the homeless guys, and it's, a bit, it's about 50-50 in this field, so. so what did some of these guys come up with? They came up with some of the, um, well, the, to be honest, the names here were not on the previous slide, the entire fair. So, in any case, by just studying black holes in general relativity, Certain uh, laws were discovered, certain uh, basic facts of black holes, they just follow from general relativity. And they're called the laws of black hole mechanics. And these are very simple laws. Um, for example, there's a statement that the area, A is the area of the black hole, of the, of the horizon of the black hole, the, the area never decreases. Uh, that's reasonable, right? Because a black hole, it can never emit something, things can only go in, so it only eats things, it never spits something out, so the only thing it does is grow, it never shrinks. That, that's, that's pretty clear. And there were some other laws were discovered, and then it was observed that these laws are very similar to known laws that govern this gas in the box, which are called the laws of thermodynamics. Um, and it has there's a precise parallel between these laws. And that's very strange, because this is a statement about, about masses, and this is nothing thermodynamic here. We did not put gas in a box and look at its energy and its temperature and so on. These are just classical things in general relativity. But on the other side, this describes the quantum mechanics of some particles in the box. But the equations look kind of the same. Now, this might just be a coincidence. It might just be a coincidence that what stands here kind of looks the same as what stands here. But then it was discovered, and this is where Hawking comes in, that you can make an argument that what stands on the left and stands on the right does not just look the same, it is in fact the same. They are the same equations. You should identify the things on the left 
with the things on the right. And there's a, there's a symbol here called kappa, and there's a symbol here called T. Well, T here is the temperature. And kappa here is the strength of the gravitational interaction on the horizon of a black hole. And if these things are really the same, then apparently we can interpret the strength of the gravitational interaction on the horizon of a black hole as a temperature. That sounds ridiculous. Why would that have anything to do with the temperature? Well, in came Hawking, because Hawking computed that black holes secretly do radiate. He combined quantum mechanics, a little bit of quantum mechanics with general relativity, and he found that black holes do radiate. And they radiate just like a, a gas in the box would radiate. And Hawking also managed to compute the temperature, and it's written here in all this glory. Um, but it happens to be precisely this K here. So that's quite remarkable. Hawking actually made a link between the left and the right precise, and he told us that whatever we thought were gravitational things, like the area of the black hole and the, temp and the surface gravity of the black hole, that these are actually, um, it should be interpreted in a thermodynamic way. So we should view of these things as temperature and so on. And that's a very nice interpretation, but it immediately leads to a, a, a new paradox, which was called the information loss paradox. And the information loss paradox is the following. If you make a black hole and you follow Hawking's computation, you can throw anything into the black hole that you want. But what comes out of the black hole is, is just a, a thermal radiation. It's perfectly thermal radiation, and it doesn't care about what you threw into the black hole. It, this, the radiation is always exactly the same. So, suppose you make a black hole by driving 500 Mercedes into the black hole. You get exactly the same radiation coming out. You could also drive 500 BMWs into the black hole, the same radiation coming out. That means that information gets lost. You cannot reconstruct from what comes out of the black hole what went into the black hole. This is what we call information loss. So a black hole is something that, that destroys information. But there's a fundamental principle in quantum mechanics which tells us that this should not be allowed. This is inconsistent with the basic framework of quantum mechanics. There's in quantum mechanics something called unitarity. And this is in disagreement with this notion of unitarity. Why am I mentioning unitarity? Because I'm not going to explain what unitarity is. But if you ever happen to walk into a physics seminar and you want to ask a question, you raise your hand and you ask, what about unitarity? <laughs> And very often it somehow is a question that might make sense and uh, you will look smart and so on. So that's <laughs> <laughs> so this is now an important uh, part of the story. So if black holes are just like a thermodynamic system, they are analogous to a gas in a box. Let's go back and see, look at this bottom line. Here there is an S here. So S was this thing called entropy, which is something like the energy of the black hole. And here's the area. So apparently we should relate the entropy with the area of the black hole. So a black hole is something like a gas in a box. It looks, it behaves in many ways like gas in a box. However, the number of degrees of freedom did not scale like the volume as it did with the gas in the box, it scales with the area of the black hole. And that's very strange. You would imagine that if you just keep on piling things together, everything should scale with the volume. How can the number of degrees of freedom, the entropy and the energy and so on, how can they scale with the area? That is very, very strange indeed. And this was the key hint that led to this thing called the holographic principle. So in this equation, you will f find a few important parameters. There's the area, there's the speed of light, there's this, Newt this uh, Planck's constant, and there's the Newton constant. And they all enter in this very simple little formula here. So somehow quantum mechanics meets general relativity exactly in this formula. So what happens in reality is that suppose you, you uh, put information on a USB stick, and you try to put as much information together as possible. And so you make a big pile of USB sticks. And you keep on piling up USB sticks and USB sticks and USB sticks. 
Then at some point what will happen is that this incredible pile of USB sticks will collapse and form a black hole. And from that moment onward, you can throw more USB sticks into the black hole. But the number of USB sticks, before there was a black hole, the number of USB sticks was proportional to the volume of the pile, right? So the amount of information was proportional to the volume of the pile of USB sticks. But by the time the USB sticks collapse into a black hole, you throw more USB sticks into the black hole, it starts to scale like the area, because that's how the uh, information in this black hole scales. So suddenly, the amount of information you can store somewhere in space-time is no longer proportional to the volume, it's proportional to the area. That, that's, and that's a very strange thing to have. And this then led, and here we go, it's the holographic principle. Because the number of degrees of freedom scale like the area at the end of the day, and not like the volume, and this is true in any theory that has gravity, because ultimately in gravity you always make a black hole. So in gravity, the amount of information you can store somewhere is proportional to the area, not to the volume. And that suggests that all the information of a region of space-time can be stored on an area, not in the volume. So we should be able to come up with something that we call the holographic screen, and we should be able to store all the information that sits in space-time, we should be able to store it all on this screen. And in that sense, this screen is like a hologram of the universe. It has one dimension less, and it's like a picture, but it contains all the information of space-time. And it's a prediction of the combination of quantum mechanics and general relativity that this should be possible. And this holographic principle was put forward by uh, Gerard het Hoofd and by uh, Lenny Saskin here. Um, so that's a very interesting. So it means that we should be able to encode everything, also everything that happens in all the cocktails that you'll be drinking tonight. It can all be encoded in some stuff living on the screen. And in particular, you can um, think about it as follows. So if you have a particular, this is the horizon of the black hole. The amount of information that sits in a region, you can think of it as living on the horizon of this black hole. And there's roughly one unit of information per little square. And these are very little squares. They're roughly 10 to the minus 35 meter by 10 to the minus 35 meters, so that's 0, 3501. And so these are very, very little squares, but they're finite size. And in each square you can put either 0 or a 1, and uh, this is how information is distributed. So it's not going with the volume, it's going with the area. So, so this is strange because if the fundamental degrees of freedom of gravity and of quantum gravity, if those fundamental degrees of freedom behave like the area and not like the volume, um, then how can it be that our world looks three-dimensional if the fundamental underlying description is two-dimensional? So somehow, these two-dimensional degrees of freedom on this two-dimensional holographic screen, they behave in such a way that they emulate our three-dimensional world. And this is something, something we call an emergent phenomenon. So some funny behavior that comes out of some very difficult behavior of some underlying degrees of freedom. And it's precisely opposite, for example, from the way water waves emerge from water, because here you have a two-dimensional phenomenon, the waves, which emerge from all these water molecules, which is a three-dimensional set of molecules. Here a two-dimensional phenomenon comes out of the interactions of three-dimensional water molecules. But the holographic principle is exactly the other way around. It says that the waves are the fundamental things, and they encode all the information below somehow. It's precisely the opposite. And another interesting example of emergence, for example, and there's many of these examples, it's a highly uh, overused, abused and overrated term, because you can pretty much apply it to anything, is you can, for example, uh, by writing down some very simple basic rules, you can see all kinds of things emerge from very basic rules. And uh, if you just look at this, this algorithm here, but I, because of time, will not go in detail through this, you can see all kinds of strange things emerge. So even if you write a few very simple basic rules, already very complicated behavior can emerge. And here the claim is that from the stuff on the screen, our universe somehow emerges. 
Now this sounds great, but can we make this into a more precise mathematical framework? Because I haven't given you any details. I, I just kind of said that morally speaking, you should be able to find a screen and put all the stuff on the screen. But I didn't tell you whether this is in fact technically possible or not. Uh, and if it's possible, where should we put this weird screen? Can we just put it anywhere? <laughs> now a hint of how to think about this, and this is how actually a, a, a very precise mathematical version of this holographic principle was constructed, was by thinking about string theory. So string theory is a theory that was invented uh, not for this purpose, but it turned out that string theory is a theory that does manage to combine general relativity and quantum mechanics. And the basic idea of string theory is that we should replace all fundamental particles in nature by a very little tiny loop of string that is, that is vibrating in all kinds of different ways. I, I'm not going to say too much about string theory, but here's a bunch of strings, they're very small loops. And here's the horizon of a black hole on the left. And you can see that when a string goes through the horizon of the black hole, and from the outside point of view, it gets cut into two pieces. And this is what we call a closed string, and this is what we call an open string. And these open strings, they end precisely on the horizon of the black hole. And so it looks like that the, the fundamental degrees of freedom that, that are associated to the screen should apparently, if we, if we want to put everything on this horizon, should apparently be associated to the endpoints of this open string. Because they sit precisely on the horizon. But all the stuff that goes on here is a bunch of closed strings. So what we would like to see is how all these closed strings, how they emerge from a bunch of open strings. And if we can explain and figure out how that works, then, then maybe we can understand a bit how this works. And this works because there is a way in which closed and open strings are different manifestations of the same thing. And that more or less works as follows. Suppose you have a cylinder. You can think of it in two ways. You can think of a cylinder as an open string that moves along a circle. But you can also think of a cylinder as a closed string that moves for a little bit of time. And because you can think of this cylinder in different ways, but it's clearly the same cylinder, this is how you can get all these closed strings from all these open strings. You just need to take all these open strings, you need to think of them, put them in loops, so think of them as cylinders, and then you need to reinterpret the cylinders in terms of the closed string. And if you do all that, and it sounds crazy, then out come all these closed strings here. And this can all be put together in a beautiful mathematical framework, which was achieved roughly uh, 20 years ago in something called the ADS-CFT correspondence. This is the guy with Fentis, Juan Maldacena. And uh, it's, it's a really amazing thing, because in this setup, there is a precise location where the holographic screen is, and we can do very precise computations, and we can test this holographic principle in incredible detail. And it works very, very well. It, it's unbelievable how well it works. So this is a very particular, concrete, technically precise, mathematical realization of this holographic principle. And then you can play all kinds of games with this mathematical toy that we found. Because the, what it describes is these closed strings, but it does not quite describe those closed strings in our universe. It's kind of a different universe. So it's, it's a toy model in the sense, it's a mathematical construction, but it's still incredibly powerful. Because, for example, what you can do is you can take in this precise mathematical setup, you can take this holographic screen. We know exactly what it is. Um, and we can say, suppose we heat up the screen. We give it some temperature. What happens to my emergent gravitational degrees of freedom? What happens if I take my screen and I give it a finer temperature? You know, what you will find is that if you heat up the screen, what it describes, what comes out of it is a black hole in gravity. And you can precise, it sounds again maybe insane, but you can do very precise computations to confirm what I've just said. So that means that a finite temperature screen is the same as a black hole. Now that's, that's great. Uh, so in particular, in this mathematical setup, 
you can see why this information loss is no longer there, so that is going to be resolved now. Um, but it also has all kinds of other applications, because if a finite temperature screen can be described by a black hole, then maybe we can turn it around. So maybe we can use black holes to learn something about finite temperature screens. It is, after all, it's, the, it's, it's a different description of the same thing. Now, there are many systems in nature that are very difficult to describe. They have nothing to do with gravity, but they're just very complicated systems because there are many, many particles interacting, and it's very difficult to compute what's going on. For example, you can do an experiment where you smash two gold atoms on top of each other with a high energy, and then out comes an incredible cloud of particles. Um, but if you do that, notice by the way that these gold atoms, they're like a pancake, they're very thin. This is precisely an illustration of what I said earlier, that if things move close to the speed of light, they become flatter, flatter, and flatter. And that these gold atoms move close to the speed of light, that's why they become very thin. And if they hit each other, then for some period here, there is a very complicated, large number of particles sitting there. If the temperature is very high, we make something called the quark gluon plasma. It's all the particles in the gold atom, they completely disintegrate, and a weird substance forms, and it's called the quark gluon plasma. It's a soup of fundamental particles, and it's incredibly difficult to compute anything in this quark gluon plasma. Now, what you can try to do is um, say, but now suppose that this quark gluon plasma was sitting on my holographic screen. Let's now try to this. So maybe it's a good theory to put on a holographic screen. And since it's, it's at finite temperature and it's, it's hot, I know that the description, an alternative description of the same system will be a black hole. So maybe by doing some computations involving a black hole, maybe I can learn something about what happened in this very complicated collision. And this can be done. And that's really a, a very nice check of the consistency of this framework in some sense. Um, if you look at the experiment, they were able to, to, to uh, measure the viscosity of this quark gluon plasma, which means, um, so viscosity is this thing that tells you if you, if you put a liquid in a jar, and you drop a little ball in it, it tells you something about how fast the ball goes down. The more viscous, uh, the slower the ball goes. And it turns out that this quark gluon plasma had a very, very low viscosity. In fact, it had the lowest viscosity ever seen in nature. And now you do this computation. That already makes no sense. You take the black hole and you do exactly the same computation. Try to compute the viscosity of this quark gluon plasma, but now doing some computation using this black hole. And you find something that is within a factor of two, the same as what was found in the experiment. And that's really remarkable, because it's so low. Uh, and there's no other good, compelling theoretical explanation right now of this very low viscosity. The best theoretical model we kind of have for it now is in this weird enough in terms of some imaginary black hole. Um, similarly, there are attempts to try to understand another thing that is very important and we do not theoretically understand at all. Those are the so-called high temperature superconductors. These are materials that become superconducting at a high temperature, which means it's not one Kelvin or something like that, it's not close to absolute uh, zero, uh, but it's, uh, say, at roughly uh, minus 210 degrees centigrade or something like that, so that's, that's kind of high, that's a high temperature as far as superconductors go. And at that, below that temperature, these materials, they become perfectly uh, conducting, which means they have zero resistance. Electricity goes for free through these materials. And clearly, if we would be able to understand the mechanism why currents can flow through this material without any resistance at all, it's really exactly zero resistance. If we would understand how that works, maybe we could invent materials that do the same at room temperature. And it would be great if we could invent power cables that have no resistance whatsoever. But unfortunately, this is a very difficult thing to understand. So what we're trying to do right now is trying to see if you can, again, come up with some sort of black hole explanation of this phenomenon. 
again, there's lots and lots of weird degrees of freedom interacting in a very complicated way. So the idea is to imagine that this thing sits on a holographic screen, map it to a black hole, and use the black hole to learn something about these superconductors. You can get some things to work, and some things don't work quite as well. So that's still an ongoing effort. So what we see is that uh, high temperature superconductors and even these things, these, these high energy collisions, they can also somehow be connected to black holes using this holographic principle. So that's really nice. And in the last few minutes, let me just mention a few things that we don't understand quite as well. So we have this very beautiful uh, framework, the holographic principle. We have a mathematically precise setup where we can do computations. But it's not yet clear exactly what the right way is to apply it in our own universe. It's namely in our own universe. We live in a universe that expands. And you can ask what would be the natural place to put a holographic screen to encode all the information in our universe. And there isn't really a good natural place to put a screen here. Maybe the only nice place to put a screen is maybe at the bottom. Uh, but that's at a fixed time. That's not where you want to put a screen. A screen should be sort of moving in time. So that's something that is very strange. But nevertheless, we can learn a few lessons from this holographic principle for our own universe. Re remember that I try to argue my way towards this holographic principle using the fact that you make can make black holes, that the amount of information in the black hole is proportional to the area. But if you put a black hole in our own universe, you can do that. And indeed, the amount of information scales with the area. But something else happens. Our universe has another horizon. It's a cosmological horizon. It's, it's a region in the universe beyond which we cannot see anything. There definitely is other a universe behind this location. We just cannot see it. The light cannot reach us. And you can also associate some sort of information to this cosmological horizon. If you make a black hole in our universe, this cosmological horizon shrinks. And it shrinks more than the area of the black hole. So if you make a black hole in our universe, rather than having a lot of information associated with it, it looks like the amount of information goes down rather than up. Uh, and that is very confusing. It seems to tell us that our universe maybe just has a finite number of degrees of freedom. And if it has a finite number of degrees of freedom, there's a mathematical theorem that tells us that ultimately everything that happens now will happen again at some distant point in the future. So that's good to know. <laughs> so in 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 348 years or something, there will be another science and cocktails here in Johannesburg. <laughs> and I will say exactly the same thing. So much for progress. <laughs> um, and what I would like to do is we try to apply these ideas, the holographic principle, the holographic screen. We try to apply it to all kinds of other ideas to learn more about it. We've tried to apply it to the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. It's still not clear exactly what, what the lesson is that we learned from that. We have tried to apply the holographic screen to learn more about wormholes and time machines. And interestingly enough, that every time we try to make a time machine, because how nice would it be to have a time machine? Uh, every time we try to make a time machine, you see that the holographic screen becomes a safe theory. It, it's not a good thing anymore that sits on the holographic screen. So holographic screens provide evidence that you cannot really make very nice wormholes. You cannot make wormholes that you can travel through and use as a time machine. Uh, yeah, and it will be very nice. So it looks like these holographic screens, they actually uh, protect us from weird things happening like this. And uh, finally, um, something else that the holographic screen is good for is trying to think a little about the arrow of time. Um, and, and the thing that we then usually, uh, we can try to use this holographic screen for is to understand a little bit better how the arrow of time comes about uh, and how exactly we move from ordered states to disordered states. Because the reason why we have an arrow of time is illustrated here. The reason that we have an arrow of time is that things like to move from an ordered state to a disordered state. That's the preferred direction to go. And you may have noticed this in your house, that things 
tend to move from an order to a disorder state and it takes some energy to move it back into an order state. But the natural motion is towards disorder. And if you drop an egg on the floor, uh, which sometimes happens, then you have a nice ordered egg and it becomes a disordered egg. And the probability of the reverse happening is incredibly small. And this is why there is something like an error of time. It moves from ordered state to disordered state. And if you apply all these sorts of ideas and somehow then um, it may be, as I was saying before, maybe at the end, if you think about the holographic screen, what we add up is, is in the universe that keeps on repeating itself. And it manages to once in a while find the possibility to reverse this process and then the whole thing starts over again. But whether all these speculations are true or not is not so clear. And I thank you for your attention and enjoy the cocktails. We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.